So what we're going to get into now is the money. Think about it like this. If you have 15 people per class, and you have a class every hour for 15 hours a day, but you only charge 120 bucks, can you support a downtown New York location? Probably not. So before that gym opened up, they should have analyzed their model to see does it make sense? Can we support this location given the price point and how many people can we actually fit in this space? So it's gonna get a little up here, but we're gonna bring it back down here. At the end of the day, we're running a business. Why do we care about that symbol right there? It's because I care about you guys being sustainable. So click the part. Sustainability comes from making money. A lot of other things come from making money. They allow you to run a successful business. They allow you to do things you're passionate about. They allow you to help your parents, you know, live the rest of their life without having to worry about working. They allow you to send your kids to good schools. Money is not evil. Money is good. It creates sustainable businesses and you can help a lot of people. So let's break down the models. First thing I want to talk about is new location considerations. Now, a lot of you guys in here might be like, you know what, I don't really want to open up a new location right now. And that's okay. But these are things to think about with your current location as well, right? Why not? Why can't you think about this? Why can't you reevaluate this for your current location? Um, you know, when you're thinking about a geographic location demographic, so for us, we're currently looking at new, opening new locations in Cupertino, California. Why am I interested in that? I talked about it yesterday where we have a key employee who's so good that I need an opportunity for that. But what I didn't tell you guys is I'm looking at Cupertino because it follows my model. What is my model? My model, which is not JP's model, is locations 15 minutes away from each other connected through major freeways that are close to big businesses because people who work make money. And I look for new locations when I believe there's an opportunity geographically and based on the demographic. So for example, I look at our locations and there's an area over here that I think we can maybe get after. Then I found out, wow, coming here, Apple's opening up a new campus that's gonna bring 5,000 new employees or maybe even like 50,000 new employees, some ridiculous number, to right here. So knowing that Apple's opening a new campus, knowing that it's 15 minutes from my locations, knowing that it is works well for free access, I determined that that's a good geographical location for me to start thinking about. Do you guys see how I'm, I'm thinking in my head? I'm not just like, no, Las Vegas sounds kind of cool. No, it's like, no, why Las Vegas, right? What, what are the benefits to it? And so for me, it's being around businesses. Maybe for you guys being around, you know, um, houses, that's fine. Maybe you go into affluent areas where you charge more. Maybe you go into lower housing where you can charge less, whatever. But you need to justify it to yourself. For me, it's this model. You look at uh, competitor offerings, right? For us, we, we worry less about this, but it's something to consider. I don't really care about the competitors in the area. Do I want to open up right next to another gym? Of course not. I'll never do that because that's not ethical. That's not the way we roll. I want to open up far enough away where I don't think it's going to hinder their business at all because everybody can be successful in this industry. When the tide rises, all the boats raise up, right? <laughs> now, but what I do look at is I look at their price points, just to get an idea of what their memberships are at, to give you an idea. But I don't let that determine my price point. But I do want to educate myself on what competitors are in the region. Space requirements and capacity, we're going to get on to that in a second. Zoning and city ordinance, right? County requirements, those are really important factors we talked about yesterday. The fact of the matter is, guys, for me, when I'm looking at this demographic, I'm saying this is where I want to be, right? Well, what do I do? I go to the city of Cupertino, and I ask them, where can I open it? And they tell me right here. So now, X marks the spot. Do you guys see how instead of me just, you know, guessing where to open, it actually, it actually kind of calls to itself through looking at a model like this. Looking at leasing versus buying. 
we, don't buy, we have not purchased any of our locations. And the reason why we haven't purchased any of our locations is because generally we've grown too fast to purchase our locations. So let me explain what I mean by that. My first location was 1,500 square feet. I have moved from here four times, okay? This is SC. If I had purchased that first location, first off, I couldn't afford it. But secondly, I now would have to figure out what to do with it when we expanded out of it. So is there a right time to buy? Absolutely. But for me, with my business model, we're still kind of figuring out what that sweet spot is for square footage. So I can't go and buy a building because I may outgrow it or it might be too much for me. Do you guys see where I'm going with that? In addition, with buying a property, you just have to personally guarantee it, which I don't want to do. When you buy a property, you're on the hook. When you lease, you have the ability to kind of be a little bit more agile. Which one's better? That's up for you to decide, but I'll just explain to you. We're gonna build out the startup costs, right? We talked about equipment, we talked about, you know, uh, essentially making the place look good from a branding perspective. How much does that cost? You know, signage outside is pretty expensive. You have to take that into consideration. Financing. The thing about financing is pretty interesting. I started my gym with $5,000. No financing, no loans, nothing. I opened up and I built from there. I started small and I worked my way up, which shows you you don't have to go financing, but you could if you want. The type of financing that I think would be cool, and JP can maybe speak to that later, is getting a loan from somebody without any additional strings attached. Meaning, hey JP, I'm gonna loan you 100 grand to go open up Brick, you know, Brazil, I want 5% interest, I mean, I want 5% uh, return, right? I want you to pay me monthly or quarterly, and uh, after you pay back my loan, we're good to go, right? I don't want any of your business, I don't want any I just want 5% back of my money. But for him, he'll probably take that all day. Why? Because he can get more than a 5% return on my 100 grand. So if he can get more than a 5% return, why use his own money when he can use my money? That would be a cool way to finance. There's other ways though. You can do equity deals and different types of things, which gets a little bit more complicated, and JP would be an expert to talk about on that kind of stuff. But in my opinion, you don't have to get financing. Start small, and then work your way up. I'm gonna use an example from, uh, what was your name? Uh, SoCal, uh, Chris, no, not Chris, was that it? Uh, I was talking about someone earlier. Did Kickstarter? Andrew Ager. Andrew Ager. I don't care if she hears this. She did a Kickstarter, right? Or, or like a Kickstarter. a Kickstarter to raise money for her new gym. She wanted to raise like 200 grand. She didn't hit her goal. She didn't even get close. But why did she need 200 grand to start her gym? If she didn't have the money, she could have found it from people maybe she knew. Or what she could have just started small in her garage, built up a community, made some money, and then grew. You don't have to shoot for the stars right off the top. Because otherwise what happens is you have other people pulling your strings sometimes as investors. So if you can do it small, try it. If you want to do it big, there's different ways. You can talk to JP about that. I'm just letting you know, I'm coming from a guy who never took on outside financing. We already talked about that. Now it comes to this. Break even and profitability projections. At the end of the day, we're running a business. Let's run through some numbers without getting too caught up in it to look at broad strokes effects of what your company can support. Okay? I'm using this model because this is what we're looking at when we open up a new location in Cupertino. This is also how JP started Brick. So the model I'm about to show you has been proven. It has. If the numbers here look scary, look like too much, let's scale it down. But these, are not crazy numbers. We're looking for a target space of 3,000 to 6,000 square feet. If I was doing it over again, or I currently am doing it, I believe that the, kind of like the sweet spot, is for each space to be 5,000 square feet and roughly 15 minutes apart from each other. Owned by the same person, so members can go to each one if they're at work, if they're at home, etc. 
The reason why I like five to 6,000 square feet is I believe it keeps the community tight. As soon as you start having these gyms that are 20,000 square feet, sometimes the community gets so big they can't be that tight. Now, I sound like a hypocrite because I have a location at 16,000, I know one's 32,000 square feet. I'm just letting you guys know that I believe this is a good model. Could you scale it up or down? Absolutely. Target lease value, $2.50 a square foot. For some of you guys, that's probably a lot. That's including triple nets, let's just call that a gross, right? Most of you guys might be in the dollar to dollar fifty square foot range, I don't know, but that's kind of what's market where we're at because we generally have to be in a more retail location like we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. and retail spaces are more expensive. We're good on retail versus warehouse. You guys are all good with that, right? And how warehouse is like 50 cents a square foot, retail is like four dollars, you gotta kind of figure it out. Target membership rate is anywhere from 175 to 250 per month, right? For us at NorCal, we charge $229 a month. Unless you're military law enforcement, you're a student, then it's uh, $189? 184. 184. <laughs> well, why 184? Not like <laughs> Coaching labor, okay? $25 to $35 an hour per coach. Now that's including burdens, right? Right, we're gonna talk about burdens in a second. But based on this model is, we're looking at it, that we need to pay people 25 to 35 dollars an hour to get some good coaching. If you're gonna pay 10 bucks an hour or 15, you're gonna get what you're paying for, right? So we build this into the model. We want a net income of $10,000 a month, eventually. That's our goal. Eventually we'll make $10,000 a month after we pay the salaries and different types of things. That's what we're able to bring home to the bank. We have a target Ross. We have a target return on sales of 25%. What that means is that if our gym brings in 100 grand this year, right, as, as, a, as our sales, we're looking to have our target return on our net income uh, be at 25% of that. So in this case, it'd be $25,000 if we run in $100,000. Okay, let's go to the next one. So what's it gonna cost you to open the doors? Is that good? What do you think about deposits, down payments, right? Generally speaking, that security deposit is gonna add up. So when you open up a new location, you're not just paying first month's rent, you're gonna pay the security deposit. And in some situations, like for example with JP, if his rent is 30 grand a month, well his security deposit is at least equal to that, right? So now you're not just opening with one month's rent, you're opening with at least two, at least. So if your rent is $1,400 a month, you gotta keep that in mind, right? How's your cash look like? Legal fees, you know, that's an interesting thing. We've done trade outs in the past, now we actually hire people, but in the past what I've done is I gave uh, memberships to lawyers who are at the gym because I couldn't afford their time. Lawyers like they work for $500, $900 an hour. So instead, I gave them a free membership and I trained them out to review contracts for me. Equipment, we talked about today, but just keep in mind, guys, if you go out and purchase 20 rowers, it's really not necessary. When I opened up my first gym, I got one rower and I spent the rest on things that we can actually get people fit with that are less expensive. You could buy, I don't know, what, six kettlebells for the same price of a, of a rower? You gotta do that. Don't feel like you have to go to shoot for the stars and equipment. Just get things that get people moving. Build out, advertising, promotion, grand opening event, those are all gonna be expenses. You just have to take this into consideration. Questions so far, what we've done, we're kind of laying the foundation. What are my goals? I wanna make, I wanna eventually net 10 grand. Eventually, right? That's not absurd to think. One day I wanna net that. How long will it be? Let's figure it out. I want to make, you know, we have a rent of this, lease of this, etc. Oh, go ahead, go to the next one. So now it's time to build it out. Can this location give me what I want? And if it can't, then I need to scratch that and move on to a new location or try a new model. 
you guys might be looking at this and be like, I'm not looking to open a new location. That's fine. But how about your current location? I had a question that said, do you think the Walmart example that you brought up yesterday could be, could work? Do you guys remember my Walmart versus North shows? And my answer is, yeah, I do. But you gotta build out the model to prove it. Walmart itself proved that the Walmart model is possible. But now we, as professionals, need to figure out what exact size do I need to accommodate that? Is it 10,000? Is it 5,000? What is it? And let's work that. So we rent 5,000 square feet of $2 a square foot gross. That's including your triple nets. For those of you who are unaware of that, triple nets are like the property taxes, uh, the, the uh, maintenance of the building, the gardening. What the landlord does is it takes those amounts, right? And you end up paying for it. So you might think you're signing up for a dollar a square foot. All of a sudden you find out it's a dollar a square foot plus triple net. And what that really turns out to, depending on when the building was purchased, depending on a bunch of different things, that could be a lot more money. Like we have triple nets that are, you know, a decent amount of money. So when I negotiate leases, I never think about it as a triple net. I think about it only as gross. Tell me exactly how much I'm gonna pay you. I don't give a shit if you mark it as rent and triple net. I don't care. Just tell me how much it's gonna cost me. So in this case, it's $2 per square foot gross, which gives us $10,000 per month. Is everybody good so far? Great. I started looking at additional expenses. Banking fees we need to get into. Because what are banking fees contingent on? How much we're charging. If you're only charging 100 bucks, your banking fees of 3% are not gonna be as extreme as if you're charging a million dollars, right? Insurance, dues and subscription, different types of things like Wattify or whatever you may be doing. Cleaning service, utilities, repairs and maintenance, and then miscellaneous supplies, right? Those are like, those are bare bones expenses. Would you guys agree? Yeah. So now we're looking at our class schedule of labor. We have an occupancy of 40 occupants. That's a lot of people. So what we're saying is that in a 4,000 square foot space, right? A 5,000 square foot space. In a 5,000 square foot space, we estimated that 40 individuals is the max that can fit in there. And even that is extreme. What did you break out, Matt, for a per square foot per person? So I want you guys to really think about what we're doing here. This is not guessing, this is just pure math. I'm sitting here saying to Matt, how many square feet do we need? How many people can we service? Out of 5,000 square foot space, we're saying that 1,000 of it is gonna be office space, right? We have a place to kind of, you know, maybe bathrooms, whatever. There's 4,000 usable square feet of space. In that, we're saying the most amount of people you can service is 40, especially if you're doing like overhead squats and snatches. Yeah, that's gonna be a shitload of people. Can everybody see what we're doing so far? So we're saying the most. Does anybody disagree with me so far that 40 is the most amount of people you should service in a 5,000 square foot space? Does anybody disagree? Perfect. No more than that, right? If someone said to me you can fit 100, we'd have a problem. The reason why that's important is because it brings me to my next question. How many classes per month am I going to offer? 240 is based off 60 classes, right? 60 classes per week. What that's gonna break down to, it's gonna be 10 classes Monday through Friday, and then I think we did uh, five and five Saturday and Sunday. So far, so good. We have Monday through Friday, we have 10 classes, Sat, Sun, five. We're gonna say the max capacity is 533 members Based that we're assuming the average member comes in four and a half times a week. I think this is a little bit high, but that's what we're basing it off. Four. Okay, make it bigger. He's gonna make it bigger. 
So guys, we're basing it off of how many members can we support given the fact that you go four to four and a half times a week. There you go. Can I see that better? So now we're saying we can fit 533 members as our total membership base. That's assuming, this is assuming that we max out our classes and that we have 500, this is the most members we can support. Is everybody good so far? Our coaching labor is $30 per coach per class, which includes burdens. Burdens are things like workers comp, state and federal taxes, things of that nature, which equal out to generally, was it 5%? 2%. 20%. It's about 20% of your total labor rate. So think about this. If I'm paying somebody $20 an hour, and they're an employee, which they should be, I'm really actually paying them $24 an hour. Because you need to take into consideration things like workers' comp. In California, if you don't have workers' comp, it's a felony. Just let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're saying that your coaching labor is $30 per coach per class. Now this includes the owner-operator, right? So if you're the owner-operator, you can put yourself there as the coach who's making $30 per class per hour. That's fine, right? We're not saying it could be anybody. But to service that class, we need to pay somebody $30. Now, the coach to class ratio is 1 to 20. Is everybody okay with the 1 to 20 ratio at the most? That's a lot, right? So now we're saying to accommodate this, we need to have at least two coaches per class. So our labor cost is $30 per coach per class times two coaches times 240 classes equals $14,400. Good? Do you guys see exactly how I'm breaking this down? I hope I'm not, I know I'm like really being slow about it, but I think it's important you guys understand how we're building this out. Okay, uh, Chris, move me on. Okay, so we have our amount, we built it all in. We said how much our labor cost is gonna be. So now we built in our direct labor, right? Coaching in hours with our gross rent and all this other stuff. Now guess what we can do next? Go ahead and click it. We say our average membership rate is $100 at 90, uh, 190 per month for basically an average based on if you're going monthly or you paid in full. Average. Go ahead and click it. Our projected member base off the start, all right? Our projected member base is going to be 200 members. We're going to say that that's our, that's, we, can, we think we can get there. That's the number that we feel like is feasible. When you guys opened your gym, you probably said to yourself, I think I can get to X amount of members. This for us is where we think we can get to. Go ahead and click it. So our projected revenue would be at 190 per member times 200 members, which gives us $38,000 a month. Go ahead. So what we did now is we built it all in. Our total revenue minus our labor, minus our rent, minus our bank fees, which is determined based on our revenue because most of our fees come in, most of our money comes in through banking fees, or uh, you know, credit card transactions monthly. So we've built out everything. Go ahead. So now, our operating, what do we say? Operating expenses give us this, okay? Go ahead. Our net income gives us a 10,000, which is a 26.3% return on sales. So what I just did is I analyzed in the beginning what were our goals to net 10 grand over time and to get a Ross, and I think it originally said 25%. So now, based on this model, we're saying that in this location, we could hit our goals. So what that tells me now is, we could proceed. But if I did all this analysis, and I couldn't come out with this based on a projected revenue with 200 members, if I did this and my numbers were way off, I probably need to either choose a different location or figure out a different model. 
right? Maybe I need to charge more. Maybe I need to charge less, right? If I came into the same location, I said, hey, I'm gonna charge 100 bucks a month. Well, the amount of members is gonna go up through the roof, right? But the amount of income is gonna stay about the same or even go less. That's where you need to play this game. That's how you determine your price. Go ahead, Cliff. Other items you need to get into consideration. <coughs> this additional labor, right? The non-direct labor. Direct labor being the coaching staff. Non-direct, right? The administrative labor. Front desk, member relations, facilities, bookkeeping, etc. Right? Those are legitimate expenses. If you're doing it, well, you still want to consider it, right? All these other things, meals and entertainment, healthcare, if you're employees, right? Taxes, additional revenue streams, meals and entertainment, all these different things take into play, right? Go ahead and click next. All right, so don't freak out, okay? This is a break even trajectory. It doesn't matter if you have five members or 500 or whatever. Guys, we can all do this. We can all do this. So day one, we open up, okay? We're fucking killing it. We open up, we're fired up. We got JP at the door in an orange jumpsuit doing his thing, right? <laughs> Kill me. I was fucking vibing with my orange jumpsuit. And you say to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just, just leave it like that. Yeah, that's it. So guys, we already know how we got these numbers. Is everybody clear there? I don't give a shit. How much you're trying your rent is. I don't care how much you're trying to make. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Everybody in this room should be able to back their model into this. Right? So now we're looking at it, right? And we're saying, okay, starting in month one, we're assuming we're gonna have 50 members. That puts our revenue in, uh, right here, and it builds our expenses up. Our net income then is negative 17,000, right? All of a sudden though, over time we grow. Once we hit month five, we hit profitability. We need 150 members to become profitable. Now, yes, 146 members makes us profitable. So when I build this out, and I'm sitting there talking to JP and he's in his orange jumpsuit. On day one, I say, hey JP, I need 146 members, otherwise we're in big trouble. But can each one of you guys say to yourselves right now, how many members do I need for break even? And then how many members do I need to hit my goals? The beauty part about our business, guys, is that every additional member we get is just more income for the company. Because we're not in, we're in a service-based industry compared to like a, a product, we don't have any additional cost. Most, maybe there might be some more labor, but every member we get adds to our bottom line. Once we hit profitability, fucking the sky's the limit, right? Because we've already covered our bases. Now, what is our base? Our base is right, 146 members. And we back that in, and it gives us a 0.2% return on sales. So we net income of 58 bucks. But now take into consideration that's still you guys taking home some money because that direct labor goes directly to you. You can just go back to the next So, hopefully that wasn't too boring, but what I want you guys to get away from this is, it doesn't need to look so fancy, but you need to know your numbers. JP says, yeah, know your numbers to, to make, Right. Great numbers, right? This is an easy way to back in for if you should open a new location, right? Or your current location. If you can't back this into your current location, perhaps you need to adjust your model a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, assuming that, you know, perhaps I should have done a better job. Um, I could have too. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't do any of this shit when I opened up. I didn't, I wish I had, but I didn't. You don't have, you know what I mean? But now knowing what I know, I would recommend this to everybody. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, how would you approach moving forward? You know, it's pretty clear to me that the only solution we need is that you see the reason by the rates. So, would that be just setting a new price point for all incoming members or 
That's a great question. So the question is, I think we're getting to is, he's probably reached roughly max capacity, right? This happens. When I opened up NorCal CrossFit, we charged $100 for military law enforcement students and $150 for everybody else. But as you guys know, as a new business owner, I basically discounted all the time. When I started my business, if someone came in and was like, hey, I'd like to enroll, but 150 is too much, no problem, I'll give it to you for 100 bucks. No problem. I don't give a shit, I need to make money now. I need to pay my bills, right? Well, you know what? I don't regret anything I did. I never will, because it allowed me to do what I'm doing now. But in hindsight, I gave away so many memberships at $100 that we, we, it, it, we, we ended up filling up our classes where people were paying 100. So what ended up happening is, like a year later I raised the rates to 125, 170, whatever it was. But I never ever went back to those people, I grandfathered them in. There's still people at NorCal Cross right now, probably a lot of people. I don't know, how many of you think we have? Do you hear what he said? 58% of the members at NorCal CrossFit pay less than $178 a month. Am I proud of that? Yeah, I am. You wanna know why? Because without them at that price point, without me doing what I did, we wouldn't be where we're at today, right? But I had to make critical adjustments at critical times. And maybe you're at one of those critical times. I had to, and I recognized, that our gym was filling up with people, which told me that I maybe needed to add, uh, charge more for my membership. If I was enrolling too many people and the quality was being diminished because I had 30 people in a class with one coach, I just raised the rates. There was a time at NorCal Cross where we stopped all incoming members, all of them, for like three to six months. And the reason why we did that is because our retention was terrible. We were signing up people left and right. And just because you sign them up, it's that whole back door theory. They go in, they go right out. So instead, what I did is I stopped enrolling people for six months because we were already profitable. We were making money. It wasn't a matter of us growing at that point. It was a matter of us making sure our quality was so good that we were sustainable. So what I would recommend is if you feel like you're hitting that critical mass, if you really need to, you can go back and raise the rates. But I never did. I felt too bad about it. But I probably should. <laughs> right? So we just need some of you did? Yeah, great. And you'd be surprised, oh, for your current members? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, how much, like 10%? 5%? You know, a lot of these guys, you raise their rate 5%, it's not gonna be the end of the world, right? You might have a few people who complain, but a lot of people, if you show them value, they're not gonna mind. So for example, if I say, hey guys, I'm gonna raise your rates up 5%, but guess what? I'm putting in showers, I got locker rooms coming in, I got new coaching staff, you're gonna be like, fuck. 5%, another 10 bucks, I get all this? Sure, no problem. But you have to prove value, right? You can't just raise the rate just to raise the rate. Yeah. Just want to add, also keep in consideration this. First of all, what he said was when he does raise, rate, raise rates, he expresses a value to everybody, how he's increasing the value for that. Amazing way to do it, to prevent pushback. Second thing is, keep in mind, every year, your costs go up. Almost everybody in this room, I would say, generally has a lease that increases in cost every year or eventually will trigger standard market increase on a yearly basis, and generally it's set, depending on your neighborhood, around 3%, all right? And if you didn't work a good lease, it could be even worse. So you gotta factor that in. So now you're growing, but now you're losing your net gains because your OPEX is increasing, right? So you gotta really be careful with that. And don't be, don't be ashamed or shy. Your members all have jobs too. They understand the cost of living goes up. So you can build that into your marketing materials uh, when you're you know, signing up for membership, if you do yearly contracts.